join me for our call to worship. I will be the one who all. The Lord of my presents God. Let us live to Christ and live. Let us live as children of God like. Let us live to God. God loves the world. We are your hearts to God. May the truth of this great love and story shine for our worship today. Let us live to God. Let us stand if we are able to sing our opening hymn number 619. Pray to my soul, God of heaven.
between God and God's people. And that pattern goes like this. God saves the people and sets them on a journey towards freedom. The people complain. God provides what they ask for. The people complain. Rescued by God from the slavery in Egypt, Israelites complain about the life in the wilderness along the way. Modern day psychologists may have some things to say about it. <laughs> First, he didn't like the bitter water. So God showed Moses how to sweeten it. Then they complained about not having food. So God sent down manna from heaven. <laughs> Then they complained that they were thirsty. So God told Moses how to access this gushing water by striking the rock. Then they whined that they missed eating meat. <laughs> and complained to Moses saying, if only we had meat to eat. <coughs> Remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing? The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. Yeah, I'm not even paraphrasing. These <laughs> right out of the Bible. God provided them food and water. Basically, every time they cried for it, listening to them whine, their gross ingratitude almost makes you blush, doesn't it? So Moses said to God, how am I supposed to feed this whiny bunch? <laughs> God told Moses to tell them, and I quote, the Lord will give you meat. You shall eat. 
you shall eat not only one day or two days or five days or ten days, but whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and become loathsome to you <laughs> because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have well before the Lord saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? See, it is not their ingratitude per se that God is upset about. Rather, it is that they don't trust God as the one who leads them to freedom and life, remaining with them along the hard journey through the wilderness. This rejection of God, this lack of trust or faith in God, is a real problem. Because if you remember, if you remember the covenant that we've been hearing in the past weeks, the covenant God made with Noah and then with Abraham, God is doing all the promising and upholding, and all that is asked of the people is to trust God, God's promise, and remain in this covenantal relationship. That's the only way this can work. So, you see this going back and forth between Israelites who complain and God who rescued them from the Egypt where they lived and died as no people in order that they can live as God's people in the promised land. With God guiding them over God. Who can they trust God? That God is the God of life for them and that God has their best interest in God's mind. All four times, they complain against Moses. Now, in today's passage, the Israelites complain once again, saying, there's no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. It's a contradiction. They're complaining about the miserable food that they don't have. And this time, not just, not just against Moses, but against, against, against God. And God responds by sending poisonous snakes, serpents, serpents among the people, and the, the serpents beat them and many die. When this happened, the people were quick to repent and ask God to take away the serpents from them. Naturally, they don't want to die. They want to live. Although they wanted to go back to Egypt <laughs> rather than to follow the Lord of life. When they see death in the form of poisonous serpents, though, they repent and turn to God, save death by removing the serpents. Then God does this curious thing. If God just wanted to bend over backward one more time to win their fickle hearts, the simplest thing would be to just get rid of the serpents as they asked. But God doesn't. The serpents remain, and people continue to get bitten by them. Instead of simply removing the serpents, God told Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and lift it up on a pole. The so only one bitten by the serpent could turn and look at it and live. There's something curious about this passage. What's curious about it? Firstly, it makes it strange that a graven image of a snake should have healing power. After all, weren't they just told in the Ten Commandment not to make a graven image of, or any, of anything to worship it? But again, this is no graven image made by human will for the purpose of worship. It is God who made it through Moses for the life-saving purpose. It is God who made it for the life-giving purpose. 
the power to heal is not in the bronze object itself, itself but in the one behind its making and its being lifted up, and that's God. To look at the serpents and live is to trust in the power of God to save. Remember formerly, it was this trust that was lacking. And secondly, and importantly, I think, God had this bronze serpent made to save anyone who had already been beaten. In other words, the serpent is lifted up on the pole in order that those who are already destined to die might live. And if those who are beaten and dying turn and look at the serpent in order to live, it is because they believe in that power of God to save, which is to say they have come to trust God. Lastly, the part of the story where God sends poisonous serpent to kill people brought me to an uncomfortable pause. God intentionally causing people to die? And why the serpent? Remember that images are very fluidly used in biblical traditions. We talked about God of mountain and you know, there's mountain images everywhere. So it's serpent. Serpent is, it ranks high as an image of ritualistic symbol. Where else have we encountered serpents in the Bible before? There's that serpent in the Garden of Eden, tempting the first humans to question, that is, to distrust God's words, and in so doing, disobey their creator God. What is this poisonous serpent in this story? What if we, we hear that as the voices within us humans that tempt to question, distrust, and disobey God? What if that serpent in the, is the voice we hear and worse yet follow that tempts tempt us away from the God of our life to the pathway back to the death of slavery? Then God did not so much send those serpents as unleashed what was already inhabiting in the hearts of the Israelites and ours, exposing or bringing to, bringing to light what was potentially deadly, hidden within, within their hearts in order to save us. When they looked at the serpents on the pole, they saw their own disobedience their sins against God, and at the same time, trusted in the power and the will of God, to God of the self-same God, to save them. There again, God bending over backward to bring life out of death for God's people. It is with this image of the serpent lifted up on the pole that Jesus talks about his own role in God's salvation history. Today's gospel reading follows Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus about how one enters the kingdom of heaven. Here now, the gospel according to John 3, verses 14 to 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, and whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, 
because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. <laughs> that the light has come into the world, and the people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those, but those who do, do this is what is true, come to the light. So that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Moses lifted up the serpent so those who were already beaten and dying could live. So also, God lifted Jesus up on the cross so those who were condemned could turn and believe in him and live. After all, isn't that the meaning of the word save? People, People already saved, saved don't need more saved. saving. Just, Just as Jesus said, the, the healthy doesn't need a physician, it's the sick who does. God bends over backwards once again and sends God's only Son to save those who are headed for certain death because they have rejected God. The Gospel of John begins. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. God so loved such world. God so loved this world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. To this beloved passage, open is used as kind of litmus test, if you believe in Jesus, Son of God, you're saved, and if you reject him, you're condemned, as if you're sitting right there and need to make a choice. But if we see how the serpent, the modest serpent, was sent to save the people who, who, were, who were bitten already, and Jesus is saying, it is just like that, that Jesus himself is going to be going up on the cross, it is for those who have been condemned already that Jesus Jesus on the Jesus on the cross exposes the sins of the world and brings to light those who are in darkness. Apostle Paul reminds us God proves God's love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. We look upon Jesus lifted up on the cross and know what the power of the sinful world did to the one whom God sent to us in love. But God's action of lifting up did not stop at the cross. With Jesus, God's lifting up continue on to God's raising Jesus from the grave on the first on that first resurrection morning, and higher still, to Christ's return to God in His ascension to the kingdom of heaven, to His and our eternal home. So anyone who believes or trusts in this crucified and risen Christ share in this eternal life. Eternal, not, not just, just me, endless, but it's a way of describing life, life as lived in the unending presence of God, as a child of God, beginning now. Eternal life begins in the believer's presence. If you trust in this power and the will of God for us, your eternal life is already here. And we are one with those who are living and breathing on this earth and those who have gone on. It's, we are one in the eternal life. Look at him lifted up and know how noble a human life can be. And keep looking at him be empowered to rise us into a newness of life. 
this in his way, which is to live in eternal life. Now we begin with doing God's will. My seminary professor, Dr. Christopher Morris, used to say to us, God saved the world through Christ once and for all, but not all at once. <laughs> God is still at work, drawing the whiners and grumblers of our world to look at the cross to see the power of their own disobedience and be led to repentance and to life eternal. Like the Israelites, we are prone to lose hope and lose trust when our journey gets tough. But God has made us Christ's church, the presence of the crucified and risen Christ in the world as it is. Let us carry on proclaiming this amazing love of God to the world, bending over backwards if we must. Amen. We are going to have Jeff sitting for our special music. Well, seeing on behalf of all the winners. <laughs> <laughs> I need to be sharing a song this morning called oh, I Am Always With you. you, and it's written it's by Bill Milford, and uh, I've known this song for a long time, I, uh, I almost in seminary, I, I, I learned it from a bunch of Rodney Episcopal priests in Berkeley, California when I was in graduate school there. <laughs> and uh, um, I played it for a lot of years, and it means a lot to me. It means I'll probably mess it up, but it's, it really is a beautiful song, and I call it, when I think about it, it's an assurance of pardon song. Every Sunday, you'll do a prayer and fashion, but there is always, always, always an assurance of pardon. And, and that's kind of how I uh, feel about this song, it's an insurance partner song. And so one other thing about it is that I was sitting in a while, and I met Scott, though, and heard the top of the story song, and I have to be able to play this song, particularly the second verse, without thinking of the top of it. So this is it. Maybe you'll too. <laughs> Always with you, I am always with you. 
Please join me in prayer. God of compassion, we praise you that you look upon our frail lives with love and understanding, and that you desire for us all new life in Jesus Christ. We are overwhelmed by your love. We chose the cross for us and yours the grave and leads us to new life. As we live this life, gracious God, in order that the children of earth might discern good from evil, you sent your son to, the, to be the light of the world. As Christ shines upon us, may we learn what pleases you in this in all truth and goodness. By your spirit, Strengthen our soul to be brave and bold in Christ's service. And now hear the voices of your children rising up in prayer to you from this congregation. Together with the prayer our Lord taught us, 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the and our second hand is number 209, we will turn to it. And it is a beautiful lyric, but perhaps not, not so familiar with melody. So, Beverly would play for us a melody once, and we will sing all verses. <clears throat> Thank you for both of you. Thank you. 